always appreciate uh, the help that you give us in uh, getting set up. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, today I'm going to be providing you with my best understanding of the current information that we have concerning the Cactoblastis cactorum. And as you see on this beginning slide, uh, this is a drawing uh, artwork that was done by Randy Westbrook, who works for USGS, and he was one of the early people that was working on the cactus moth occurrence in the United States beginning back in 1989. But if, if you look at the drawing, the entire life cycle of the, uh, the moth is here. And so if you uh, look on the very left side of the drawing, you'll see the adult male and female. Uh, you'll see reproduction uh, taking place at this stage. And then up at the top of the drawing on the left, you see the female cactus moth uh, is going to be laying eggs. So that, that begins our series of the life cycle right down to where I have the pointer now is one of the egg masses. And as if you look to the right, uh, both of these are egg masses that are on the prickly pear pad. Once those egg masses hatch, uh, larvae come out and they go to the bottom of the spine or the bottom of the column of, of the egg stick and they bore a hole in the pad and they enter the pad and they begin eating inside. And if you look at where I have the pointer now, these are the larvae inside the Opuntia cladophyll, the cladophyll I'm going to be calling a prickly pear pad during most of the talk, but the larvae are inside uh, growing and going through instar stages and ultimately down at the bottom of the pad you'll see that they become engorged and in the final instar stage before they come out on the outside of the pad uh, and then they go and pupate and down at the bottom of the screen the white circle areas are the pupae and the pupae are in the litter or underneath the prickly pear pads. So one thing the drawing does not show is that the pupae stage can actually be attached to the lower pads. But once these the larvae have engorged, what we see over here on the right side is the prickly pear pad is going to be killed and ultimately the pad in the bottom right shows you that it collapses. But the pads become basically see-through and when the uh, larvae have engorged, uh, they come outside to fall to the ground and pupate. But if they haven't eaten enough out of that pad, they will actually go through the neck of the pad into a lower pad. And that's one of the things that we're going to be uh, talking about in the identification of the Cactoblastis cactorum if I'm outside looking at prickly pear and what do I look for. But this drawing is unique and Randy Westbrook is the one who did the drawing. If we look at the current history of the Cactoblastis cactorum in Texas, note that here in 2006 at the top, the Agricultural Research Service models predicted that the cactus moth would arrive in Texas in 2007. At that time, uh, I was alerted by a research associate from Colorado State University, Laura Tyler, who was working in Mexico, that the cactus moth uh, was moving from Florida through the Gulf Coast region and heading toward Texas. And in Texas, uh, AgriLife Extension, we began an educational program, much like we did for the Africanized honeybee, where the educational program alerted the citizens of Texas and the United States beginning four years before the 
um, Africanized form of the honeybee came across the Rio Grande River. Uh, if you look at this second date, in 2008, uh, the ARS perfected and released a cactus moth pheromone, uh, a lure that we could use for trapping the male moth in a wing-type trap. And it, in 2008, we went from doing sentinel surveys and just looking at prickly pear plants to using the wing-type trap uh, in various locations. And actually, uh, beginning on July the 8th, 2008, uh, the first uh, extension traps through a cooperative agreement with USDA APHIS, PPQ, were set up in the port of Corpus Christi. And from the state aquarium all the way to the USDA building at the turnaround of the port, uh, 21 moth traps began uh, surveying, helping us survey for the cactus moth in the Nueces and San Patricio County area. Because uh, it was thought that one of the ways that the moth might come to Texas is also from ships that come from infected parts of the Caribbean and all the way down to South America. Well, those lure traps that were run for every two weeks beginning in July of 2008 up until uh, the first cactus moth was found, and through today, those traps have never caught an adult cactus moth. Now, that's in New Aces County. So, with uh, having volunteers, and I did have up to 137 volunteers helping to manage uh, 600 uh, lure traps and also 300 sentinel survey sites, at, during this period of time, we never found the moth until June the 25th of 2018. The first moth was found in Brazoria County by a trained Texas Master Naturalist volunteer, Ruby Lewis, who had had the training about the moth seven years earlier. So in 2018, the cactus moth was confirmed in Brazoria County and Matagorda County. And note that the Brazoria County was actually a sentinel survey, finding the larvae on the outside of the pad. But the Matagorda County record, the first catch was with the lure trap that was, it caught the moth in downtown Bay City on June the 29th of 2018. Now, these records, uh, were all sent to our USDA identifiers um, up at Maryland or at the U.S. National Museum. So the June the 25th collection was actually verified on June the 29th. If I look at 2020, uh, due to the kind of warm winter that we're having, we've already had larvae on the outside of prickly pear pads uh, where people have found the larvae in Colorado and most recently in Chambers County. So those have been looked at and identified and confirmed to be the cactus moth. So the Colorado County is Columbus and over in Chambers County the larvae were found next to a rice field on prickly pear on top of a levee uh, south of Anahuac. Now, the last category is unconfirmed or suspicious counties, and we do have uh, things that are being looked at that come from Jackson County, Calhoun County, and, uh, and of course, Galveston County. So when I look at the confirmed records, the Galveston County is in between Chambers County and Brazoria County. So you might suspect that we already have the moth there, but until you go look and you can collect a specimen by one method or another, and until it's confirmed, you you don't call a county uh, as part of the in, infect, infected role that we have here in the state. The, the Cactoblastis life cycle, uh, if we start with the adult, you see that goes over to the female. 
um, and laying eggs on the end of a spine or laying eggs on the top of the pad at the areole where the glochids come out. Uh, the eggs, 50 to 80 eggs in this image, but I have found from 9 to 118 eggs in an egg stick when they hatch. Then we have these early instar larvae, and they're going to go inside the pad through a hole that they cut. Uh, when they become gregarious and adult larvae, they look like this. Now, notice the larvae are orange with black spots or black stripes. I, I want you to remember this because it's important that when I'm looking at prickly pear and I find insect larvae on prickly pear, this Cactoblastis cactorum, the cactus moth, is the only one that we find that will be orange. So it's a pretty good indication when you find orange larvae that look like these that you have the cactus moth. Now, the slide in the bottom left, the, pic, the image shows that as the larvae eat the inside of the pad out, that the pad wall will become so thin that light will come through it from the internal feeding that the larvae are doing. But look down at the bottom of the pad, this part, the basal part of the cladophyll has not been consumed yet. But once the larvae engorge and they fall out on the ground, then they pupate is in the top left image. And then the cycle, when these hatch and become adults and an adult flight takes place, we're right back to the adult stage again. So with that, from the knowledge that you have just heard uh, and from the life cycle of the Cactoblastis cactorum, where do you believe this issue of a regulated insect should begin? And Pete, let's ask the question. So if each one of you will mark one of those, the adult mating and egg laying, or the egg masses found, or the larval stage with infected prickly pear pads, or the pupae stage, or look at the last one, the host removal by burying and destroying all prickly pear. So where do you think, based on the science that we know, where would the weak link be where we could effectively come out with management to halt or even stop uh, the further invasion of the cactus moth in the state. And uh, while they're voting, uh, there's a question that came across is, where did the testing take place in a lab or an area where moth uh, were already known to be? Yes, a, a lot of the testing, uh, as I'll get to here in a minute, was done in South America. Uh, the cactus moth is native to southern Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. And so the moth was researched in the 1920s to be used as a biological control agent where unwanted prickly pear from Central and South America was now becoming a problem plant uh, in various countries of the Eastern Hemisphere where the prickly pear was introduced as a food or a livestock foddering plant. So if you imagine uh, in the late 15th century and 16th century, all the food plants of the Western Hemisphere were introduced, were applicable to the Eastern Hemisphere countries, and the prickly pear actually turns out to be one of those that we know was introduced into 51 other countries, mainly from Central and South America. So, Pete, why don't we go ahead and cut the voting off with that and uh, recognize that a lot of people put in that our attack should be on the adult mating and the egg laying stage. That was the number one vote getter. So look at this image, uh, a new prickly pear pad 
and notice that there are five egg sticks on here, one, two, uh, three, and four, and five. And so the egg sticks here by, that are laid by the Cactoblastis cactorum are also very similar to other cactus moths in several other genera that occur naturally in the state of Texas. So pretty much the presence of an egg stick might tell you you have some kind of moth or larvae that's working on the prickly pear, but it is not a definitive clue that it is the Cactoblastis cactorum. Now, notice on the image here where I have the arrow, when the eggs have not hatched, usually the egg stick is very rigid, but as the egg stick, the eggs hatch out, and they become older and weathering, they fall, they fall parallel or flat against the prickly pear pad. And by seeing that look, as we see down here, you know that the eggs have hatched and the larvae have emerged. The other thing that we've learned from being in the field and working with the plants that are, are infected since 2018, that as the Cactoblastis moves from one pad down to the next pad because generally the concept is the Cactoblastis cactorum female will lay the egg sticks on the terminal pads on our larger multi-padded prickly pear. But as the larvae uh, move, notice the hole that is here in, in the neck between two pads. It's not a stem, but it's a connecting neck, and the larvae will bore a hole to move into the next pad because they will not emerge until they are at the fifth instar and gregarious or engorged. Now, if I go in on a sentinel survey and I look at the pad and I think it might be infected, we often cut that pad open because the way I'm going to find the larvae in the pad is by seeing who's in there. So a sharp instrument, a slicing tool, in this case in Chambers County, was used to open the pad and, and see what was inside. And, and here, uh, Tyler Fitzgerald, the, the uh, Jefferson County Extension agent, found the larvae inside the pad and then contacted me. And I went down and investigated. And ultimately, we had a report of a new county with the Cactoblastis cactorum. Notice in this image that there, in the young, in younger instar stages, that the Cactoblastis cactorum can actually be yellow. And this was kind of confusing in 2018 when we were looking for strictly an orange larvae. But these larvae that are yellow have not turned orange. They're usually less than seven millimeters but they still have the black spots or the black stripes. Now, in this image, and these larvae are actually on the outside of the pad, but notice they're not either yellow or orange, and they don't have any black spots on them, but they too are the cactus moth larvae. So the larvae are most easily identified by us in a sentinel survey by being orange in color. Whatever we find, if it is a suspect, then we're going to collect it, put it in alcohol, and we're going to turn it in to have it correctly identified by the professionals that we have today. So like in the English language, there are exceptions to everything. And this is one of the instruments uh, that we use that we can handhold using tongs, are using very thick leather gloves to hold a prickly pear pad that we slice down. And uh, the blade is sharpened at the end to make it easier cutting. And these tools come in various diameters for whatever size prickly pear pad that you would like to be looking at. So with that information, look at these four images. And Pete, we want to ask them out of A, B, C, and D to pick the one that is the Cactoblastis cactorum.
and we're halfway there, Pete, to the total number of participants. As they vote, uh, there's a question of what drives the color variation in larvae? It, it, it's mainly due to age, and it's, it's not uh, something unusual within larvae uh, that they change uh, color or darkness or lightness uh, as they are going through the various instar stages. That would be my, my best answer. So Pete, we, we have a majority that have voted. So 98% uh, of you selected D, which is correct. Here are the orange larvae. Now, these other pictures are of larvae of other genera. And, and mainly, this is the genus Melitara, which is also a cactus moth. But the ones in these pictures have actually been found in prickly pear pads in the state of Texas. Uh, an unusual one, uh, fluorescent purple, was found in the crown of the root between the pads and the root uh, in Menard County uh, just a few years ago. So there is some, some pretty good science that we're going to be looking at uh, when dealing with our field work. So prickly pear can be found on rangelands. It can be found in forests growing from East Texas all the way to Maryland. Um, it's in our metroplexes. It's planted as a landscaping plant in our towns and in our yards. So if I'm going out and looking at prickly pear, what actually am I looking for? So notice, here's a prickly pear plant, uh, and I'm looking at it. Can you tell at the distance that we're at is it infected with the cactus moth or not? So usually the sentinel survey uh, requires you to get up closer to the prickly pear uh, and to look at the pads. Notice in on this close-up of the pads, you see no egg masses. You see no necrosis. You see no internal damage occurring. You don't see the larvae on the outside of the pad. And I don't see any of the feces or frass produced by the larvae inside streaming out on the outside of the pad. So this is what a healthy pad uh, in our sentinel survey would look like. But when I find infected pads, now I'm going to be looking for the key signs to know whether to open the pad up or not. So here uh, in this left side, from the top to the bottom, the black material that you see is the fecal material of the cactus moth larvae that oozes out of a hole that the cactus moth cuts to let the feces drain to the outside of the pad as they continue eating the inside material of the pad up. So this is from Chambers County. And when this pad was cut open, that notice from this area here at the top over to this side here and this area here and to the bottom right here, this is the area that the larvae were found in. This part of the pad to the center and to the right did not have the larvae in it. So oftentimes you have to inspect the entire pad where you see a sign of necrosis or the fecal material on the outside. Here is an example of another infected prickly pear pad. But when this pad was opened, even though there's a lot of frass material up and down the pad, only one larvae was found on the inside. But look at this where I have the pointer right now, an exit hole. And actually, one larvae uh, was found coming out. In, the, in this image, we're in Matagorda County. Uh, and this is uh, in between Bay City and Matagorda, prickly pear uh, growing in the fence line. Now, what do you think about the look of that pear? 
this uh, terminal pad to the far left shows no signs of necrosis or any problem. But look at this highest up pad where I cut a chunk out of a pad that looked infected. And yes, indeed, uh, in October of 2018, I found cactus moth larvae infecting this pad. So look at how the, the rest of the prickly pear pad has been or is currently infected uh, with the cactus moth larvae or pieces of the pad have actually already fallen off as they were hollowed out and they have fallen to the ground. So one thing I'm looking for is hollowed out prickly pear pads as a sign that the cactus moth may have been there. In this image, I'm looking at a terminal pad and notice that I can see sunlight coming through parts of the pad. Now, this is a large area of necrosis. I see no egg sticks. I see no larvae on the outside of the pad. But indeed, when this pad was cut open, uh, there were around 25 larvae on the inside of the prickly pear pad just eating away. So these are the kind of things that I'm looking for in the survey. In Chambers County, uh, notice the larvae here on the outside of the pad. Uh, the county extension agent was actually riding on a four-wheeler through uh, the edge of a rice field, and he saw the engorged larvae on the outside of the pad, and having been trained about the identification uh, in a sentinel survey for the Cactoblastis cactorum, he stopped, uh, opened this pad up, and yes, it was infected, and uh, one pad that he found had about 20 larvae on the outside. Now, this, this is earlier in March and uh, is a little bit early for what we expect to see with emerging larvae. Because of the warm weather, these larvae probably overwintered in the prickly pear pad, and they were consuming the pad all winter, but they would have come from a third or fourth adult flight that was laid back in the fall, and then the eggs hatched and the larvae got inside the prickly pear. So always opening the prickly pear pad up and finding the orange and black spotted or black lined larvae on the inside is the more sure way to suspect that you have the cactus moth. Now I didn't say to confirm because again a an identifier must confirm that it is the cactus moth. So in our question three take a very close look at this prickly pear pad and this is our question number three Pete and we want you to mark, if you were doing a sentinel survey, would you say that this pad is probably, yes, infected with the Cactoblastis cactorum or probably no? So if you'll answer this question for us based on what we just learned through uh, time and testing and looking with the sentinel survey, what would you think about this pad if you saw it? As they answer the, the survey, there's a question that came across. Uh, when livestock go to eat the prickly, pad, prickly pear pads and ingest the worms, will they infect livestock? You know, Pete, in all the examples that we have in Matagorda and in Brazoria County with infected prickly pear pads, I have yet to see that a cow ate one. So I really, I really don't know. Uh, if the cattle will eat, uh, you know, the necrosis may be one thing that keeps them from eating that pad. And then, of course, the prickly pear spines, uh, unless the individual is growing a spineless prickly pear that is escaped out onto the land, or they're in a prescribed burning regiment on their land, uh, I'm going to say that the cattle are probably not going to eat much of the prickly pear and, and not, mu not much or even at all on those that are infected. Hopefully that answers the question suitably.
So 40% have said probably yes, and 60% Pete have said probably no. And I'm going to tell you that when this prickly pear pad was opened up, it was not infected with the Cactoblastis cactorum. There was nothing found inside. So these kind of signs of, of necrosing material and indentions uh, are showing us when we open the pad that they were not a sign that the uh, Cactoblastis cactorum was in there. There are many different kinds of bacteria uh, uh, sucking insects that will make lots of patterns and appearance on the pad, but think about what we just went through that would be the signs of the Cactoblastis being in there. Thank you for answering that question. Now, let's go and look at some prickly pear that is dying. And so here is a, a prickly pear that when it was first observed, it was five foot tall. And uh, notice now that here at the bottom, many of the pads have dropped off. They've been infected with the Cactoblastis cactorum. I, I can see damage in this pad. I can see damage in this pad and down through here. And when this prickly pear plant uh, was looked at, the Cactoblastis cactorum larvae were found. But they weren't found in every pad. They were found where at that time of year, and this is in July, that the larvae were active. So again, look at the terminal pads to the far right that are growing. They don't have egg masses on them, and they're not infected. So some of our prickly pear with large basal stems, and this spineless prickly pear, which is from central Mexico, it has a six to eight inch stem similar to our Texas Nepal that we have down in South Texas. When we find those, uh, I'm gonna find infected and uninfected, but the prickly pear was, is ultimately gonna look like this. These large stems, the cactus moth is not gonna be found in the stem. The, the cactus moth larvae and the damage are done in the cladophyll or the prickly pear pad. So what you see here, even though this prickly pear was pruned and trimmed and, and the prickly pear infected pads destroyed, uh, the thing sprouted back. So it did not take this prickly pear plant to the ground and actually kill it. So as the plant is able to re-sprout, uh, one of the functions of prickly pear pads and, and that large basal stem, the prickly pear plant survives. And here is a row of, of prickly pear starting up here at this fence, uh, both down the fence and down the road, you're going to see prickly pear in, in, in various stages of infection. Uh, and even here, the prickly pear stem is there, but the prickly pear was fairly the pads were annihilated. You can see damage visually in this pad right here in the central part of the picture, but it's not totally dead. But this, this damage that you're looking at took place uh, based on what the landowner was able to tell me along his front yard. The damage occurred in one year. So we, we expect that we have three or four adult flights during the year, beginning in the spring and going to the fall, and that prickly pear uh, can be reinfected over time through the year. But this was taken to the ground, and this is over in Brazoria County. So, so what do we do about the cactus moth now in Texas? What are our expectations for prickly pear growing in the urban centers of Texas and on our Texas rangelands, our ranches and our wildlife management areas. We have to begin uh, with the worldwide history of the issue, and that's going to begin in Australia because the cactus moth, again, is a native moth of South America. It's, it's in the Americas, and the cactus moth was used as a biological control agent 
uh, in Australia in the 1920s and South Africa in the 1930s. So through May of 2018, Texas was the only U.S. Gulf state noted to be free of the cactus moth, thus the last infected, uninfected zone between the cactus moth in Louisiana and Mexico. But perhaps the cactus moth was in Texas as early as 2014, but went undetected until June the 25th. See, how, how do you know the exact date? It's based on a time when we find it, but circumstantial evidence and testimonies also tell us that it already could have been here seven years earlier. And so the moth larvae on pads of prickly pear were in her yard. Uh, Texas Master Naturalist volunteer Ruby Lewis reported this and sent samples to the Brazoria County Extension Office to the horticulture extension agent. And by Friday, we had a confirmation that the first cactus moth had been found in the state of Texas. And so within a week, the infected prickly pear had been harvested and buried two feet deep at the county disposal, and the amount buried out of her yard equaled 3.3 tons of prickly pear and, and took a dump truck to carry it all off, uh, bagged in a kind of plastic bag that the larvae would not be able to eat through. And a second site generated seven-tenths uh, tons uh, and then a survey was established with USDA APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine, and it covered on this map uh, an area in Brazoria County of 676 square miles. The, the part of the map down that you see here in the bottom left, that was an area where Texas Master Naturalist volunteers uh, were employed to go and survey up and down roads and on property and along roadsides during this survey period. So this area, rather large, and it did generate a lot of find of prickly pear, but at the same time, uh, the top left picture here, Ruby Lewis, where I have my pointer, she's the one uh, that found the first cactus moth larvae, and then the right picture is the team uh, that USDA APHIS uh, Plant Protection and Quarantine with our volunteers put together to come over and do host removal. Uh, Maurice here in the central picture, he was part of the team uh, that went over, he led the team in Louisiana in the port of New Orleans to uh, get rid of the cactus moth by doing total host removal, and at that time, volunteers from Mexico actually came over and helped with that several month long project of getting rid of the cactus uh, to stop the further movement of the prickly, uh, the cactus moth. So in 2009, in June, USDA APHIS put in a quarantine uh, on the movement of prickly pear uh, from infected states to any outside uninfected state. Uh, and th this is listed in the Federal Register as 27,071 in volume 74, number 108. And the domestic quarantine restricted the interstate movement of the South American cactus moth uh, host material. It wasn't the moth, it was the host material uh, that was coming out of nursery stock, uh, coming from growers, uh, and it was the plant parts even for consumption as uh, nopalitos, the cactus moth pad, are actually sold in grocery stores in the United States and here in Texas. So the step was taken to prevent the further expansion of the cactus moth, uh, and this was done after the cactus moth was discovered by a fisherman near the port, on the port dredgings in the port of New Orleans. Uh, sometime later, though, the regulation was dropped because there was a period of inactivity and no new fines uh, from that period of 2009, 10, 11, and 12 until the find in Texas in 2018. So in the history 
of our opuntia, the host plant, uh, prickly pear is only native to North, Central, and South America. The prickly pears of the other part of the world are there because they were introduced. We don't have any opuntia growing in Africa. And so these were historically, though, planted around the world for fruit, the fruit that's consumed, and for forage or fodder, and then because of the cochineal insect, uh, there was a purple and blue dye that was harvested out of the webbing of the insect. Texas has 19 to 25 species of opuntia, while Mexico has 45. Uh, as I go west in the United States, the number of species of opuntia decline, but the Agricultural Research Service in Georgia uh, through caged and uh, cactus moth uh, confinement have found out that all of our padded uh, prickly pear plants in the genus Opuntia are going to be the host for the prickly pear. The things that aren't are the Choya or our stemmed uh, Opuntia or things like Tassahia Opuntia uh, that we call turkey pear. Those have not been shown to be the host. So, in a biological control, uh, look at this picture on the right. This is the level of infestation from the time of introduction uh, to no biological nat natural control being there from a disease or an insect or anything in Australia, where about 120 million acres of Australia uh, became infected. And so, the Cactoblastis uh, was taken from Argentina uh, to be used as a biological control agent. Uh, and look at this image on the left. This is 1928. Uh, and if I look at this tree right here in the top part, uh, and I look at this tree in the central part of the picture, in this 1929 picture, these images, uh, these trees are still there to show you some key points, but look at the damage from the Cactoblastis cactorum, uh, being the egg masses, egg sticks being put out, the actual larvae being put out, mainly the biological control was done using egg sticks. So here uh, the insect was, was used. So when I look at what's happening in Texas, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about how would I stop or how would I mitigate the cactus moth, and I can think about control and management, one of the first things you have to do is think about the attitude and the knowledge of the citizens that live in the state and what they do in their daily lives. You have to consider the correct identification of the pest. Uh, we always are driving for early detection of a one unwanted pest because it's going to be more cost effective and easier to stop an organism before it starts uh, it spreading its range and becoming so financially impossible there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, detection of an organism by a sentinel survey, the lure trapping, and I'm going to say a few things about a sterile insect technique and then host hand removal of infected pair, uh, kill, uh, noting the egg, ma egg sticks are there and hand pulling them and crushing them on the cement with a hammer to kill them, uh, and then host removal in large enough areas. So think about these things that have come up in our management, but I want to begin with talking about what if I find the Cactoblastis on the prickly pear in my yard. Look at this infected prickly pear pad here, and if you found it, normal people in a city in a metroplex, if something has a disease, they throw it in the urban uh, disposal, the trash can, they dispose of it out on the curb for the city or the county to pick up, and these are not the appropriate things to be done with infected prickly pear because the prickly pear is not going to die just because you dug it up. Prickly pear is some species of cacti are noted to live up to three years without being rooted in the ground. 
And so how would I properly dispose of this prickly pear? And it's part of our educational people to, to take care of the prickly pear. And I'm going to show you a series of slides, but this is going to take uh, selecting a site to bury the prickly pear, infected prickly pear. If I'm going to get rid of it, I can do it in my own yard. I can do it on my own ranch. Uh, but it's going to take digging a hole that's going to be 24 inches deep. And uh, note right here on the yardstick, this is uh, this metric stick, this is 24 inches. So I'm going to be digging a hole that I'm going to be bearing the pear at 24 inches. That's 24 inches of soil on top of that prickly pear. So I go in, uh, and as in scene one, I've dug a hole here that's 26 inches deep because that prickly pear, when I put it in the bottom of the hole, I want it to be covered with 24 inches of soil. So this is what my hole looks like in picture number three. And then I put my infected prickly pear pads at the bottom of it. Then I begin the covering process. But along the way, I'm going to use the butt end of my sharpshooter to pack the soil so that I can get most of the soil back in the hole. And I'm going to end up with a finished product that looks like this. And, and I have made ways that the uh, cactoblastis cannot come back to the surface and then be a potential uh, infector of prickly pear again. So. In the attitude of people, look at this article uh, that Wayne Hanselk and I wrote and put in the Cattleman magazine in 2006 about this issue. And uh, we wrote an article uh, that led a guy to write to the editor. I read the ridiculous article in last week's paper on page 10, Texas A&M professor warns of danger to wildlife. The last half of the article tells of a dangerous cactus moth that threatens to destroy our prickly pear. Isn't this something we've been trying to do for years? Uh, with expensive and dangerous chemicals that certainly do nothing to help our environment. And he further, uh, a, a further uh, article in a newspaper about our article on prickly pear friend or foe in April of 2006 uh, that Wayne Hanselka and I put together. Uh, Dr. Hanselka and Dr. Rector do not seem to be very well informed on the benefits of prickly pear. None of their claims uh, of benefits would be true in Young, Throck, Martin, and Baylor counties where I ranch. And then Laura Tyler wrote an article on watching for the cactus moth and how to identify it. And he said, does not appear to understand our problem with prickly pear. I can see no benefits for the rancher from this very invasive plant. So he's calling the prickly pear the invasive organism. So the cactus moth would be the greatest thing for the Texas rancher since the eradication of the screw worm. It would be criminal to try to stop the spread of this insect. We should be aiding the invasion of the cactus moth rather than attempting to stop it. So what is the attitude of our people? So prickly pear, it occurs roughly on 28% of our rangeland in Texas, about 26 million acres. Uh, both the cactus moth and the prickly pear were not native to Australia, uh, but we introduced it there and we used a biological control agent. Uh, the Apuntia species that we're concerned about in Texas are native uh, and occur in other southern states, but the cactus moth isn't. So after introducing the cactus moth in Australia and South Africa, today, 80 years later, both the moth and the prickly pear are still present, but they're in some kind of equilibrium with each other. So this is leading us to understand what an outcome might be in Texas when I, when I look at this map, and uh, five-sixths of the state of Texas is within the area that the cactus moth could live and survive with the prickly pear that we have. The, we have no natural biological control agent or one that has been found in South America that can be brought to Texas to kill the cactus moth. Uh, most 
if, if you see in the bottom right picture, spraying the prickly pear with a chemical to kill the larvae inside the pad ha has not been effective, even though there are some options still being looked at. The sterile insect technique has been looked at, but to repeat what we did uh, previously in the 1950s and 60s, it's going to be very expensive. And, and at, this at this time, the work shows uh, on an island in the Gulf that, yeah, we can get rid of the moth there, but you didn't get rid of the moth down the coast. Uh, and it migrates back in. Mating disruption is also being looked at, but there's no final thing on there. So the, the thing that we're doing, and, and if we want to build a barrier to stop the moth, then get ridding, getting rid of the host seems to be one of the things that we can do uh, to build a no-host zone. But in Texas, we got 25 million acres. We do have chemicals. Uh, in our brush busters program uh, that we're using to chemically remove prickly pear, uh, such as this in this case with picloram through Tordon 22K or, or even with surmount uh, that has uh, two chemicals in it, the fluoroxypyr and the picloram. So we are able to effectively get rid of prickly pear. Uh, but again, it's a, a, a costly effort in the amount of prickly pear that we have. When I look at the uh, natural fire regime that existed in the Texas, notice down on the coast, the coastal prairie, the wetlands of Texas, most of our native prickly pears grow on a drier land. If they grew in water, they would get a fungus, a disease, and the prickly pear would die. But some of our introduced prickly pear are, are coming from areas of higher rainfall, and they are surviving on the coastal Gulf Coast zone of the wetland prairie. So I think about fire. Fire becomes a, a practical tool, uh, as you see in this picture, a prescribed burn uh, that can be used to kill prickly pear. But even in this picture, the, the amount of prickly pear that's going to be killed depends on the amount of fuel. And notice down here at the bottom of the image, there is still a green prickly pear. And some of the prickly pear, it may be top killed, but it comes back. So that usually we see a 10% to 90% control of prickly pear using prescribed burning. So will it work? But it is a practical tool in range management that can bring the host back to some natural earlier occurrence level than what we see today. The lure trapping that we have only catches the male moth. And uh, here's a volunteer running, uh, putting in a new lure and a cactus moth trap bottom every two weeks to help survey. But I don't think we'll ever put out enough traps to catch all the males. Now, the sterile technique uh, would take a sterile male moth and mate with a uh, a female moth, and we would flood the environment with sterile males so that no more successful reproduction would take place. Uh, this is successful in cage studies, successful in actually in one program release. Uh, right now, we're looking at our sentinel survey to be our number one method to find out where the cactus moth is, and then decisions to be made based on our ability to look at the damage and identify and come up with what we see on prickly pear is the cactus moth. A lot of damage on prickly pear is not due to the cactus moth, but it may even be induced by people running a weed eater uh, in their yard. So the in the island of Nevis in the Caribbean, uh, the cactoblastus was introduced there to get rid of non-native prickly pear. And, and as we see by 1989 here in Key West, Florida, we had the cactus moth that ultimately made it onto the mainland of Florida. Uh, so the prediction model showed that it would be in Texas at Port Arthur or entering the state through Louisiana by 2007. 
where I have the pointer right now is where we found the first cactus moth. The Chambers County record is right here where I have the pointer. The Matagorda County finds are right down here. The Nueces County in, in the port of Corpus Christi is right here, and we're not finding any. So what should we do? What should we build our expectations around and knowing that people themselves through transportation going on a vacation and bringing a cactus moth uh, infected prickly pear pad could happen. The retail business could be selling the cactus moth. And so we're going to have problems. We're going to have issues with agriculture and natural resources that we have, including the prickly pear. So Mexico, they have done an excellent job in their educational campaign. Uh, and when Isla Mujeres in, in the Gulf of Mexico became infected, they went through and did total host removal to stop the prickly pear uh, from becoming a major problem uh, and coming over nine kilometers to Cancun, where we also had uh, a lot of prickly pear growing there. And again, they did total host removal to stop that invasion. So what are, what are our choices here in Texas? Uh, our expectations, if we do nothing, the cactus moth will continue to advance down the coast our coastline is rich with abundant host plants, and it'll end up at the mouth of the Rio Grande and in Cameron County. Cities will continue to support a large host plant environment, supporting a large population of the cactus moth for furthering and increasing distribution into the central part of the state of Texas. Nurseries, growers, plant wholesale outlets could contribute to a faster spread of the cactus moth unless the prickly pear plants became a normal item of inspection, including the inspection of prickly pear pads at grocery store outlets for human consumption. In the final stages, we would end up in a scenario of having both the prickly pear still alive in Texas and the cactus moth still alive in Texas in some unknown, undefined state of equilibrium, much as we've seen in Australia and South Africa. And so at this point, though, we would have less prickly pear than what we are seeing today. I'm not going to say less prickly pear than what occurred naturally in the state. But you must consider that javelina, a native wildlife animal, um, 90% of their year-long diet is prickly pear. Uh, Webb County uh, white-tailed deer diets show prickly pear makes up 15% of a white-tailed deer diets year-long. And we know that rats and mice and the jackrabbit and the cottontail all use prickly pear, especially in the wintertime, as emergency food. And we know animals like the coyote are eating the tuna or the prickly pear fruit regularly as a food source. So yeah, there would be a change. So our future here in item two says that we should continue an educational program to these different audiences about the cactus moth and what to do if it is found. And my item number three, as a society living, we're still living in the era of soil and water conservation, we should continue to promote proper management of our rangelands and teach and demonstrate the art of decision making and use of tools that can help us reach our goals, such as reducing unwanted prickly pear. We should continue to use the findings of science to help us see success or to know when to change our plans and move to something else. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, what we want to look at is the future is right now. The decisions need to be made and the tools of management employed right now, or it, we will see that we'll ultimately have the cactus moth in all the viable parts of the state of Texas 
where there is a suit about a suitable amount of host and there is a host uh, line of food that can carry the cactus moth there. I, I want to thank you today, uh, Pete, for being a part of this uh, and seeing what we're up to, what we're facing, and generally from my personal perspective, what is an expectation of the future? Uh, please contact us uh, if you have any other questions. And, and I do want to thank uh, USDA and the Texas Department of Agriculture uh, and our many volunteers who have helped us to get us to where we are today and understand uh, where the cactus moth is. The government alone can't do it. So the many volunteers have, who have worked on this, we appreciate them very much. Thank you very much. Pete, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, could the cattle which don't eat the infected prickly pear possibly smell the pupae? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. I, matter of fact, I don't even know what the cow can smell. Uh, second question by Matthews. Or if they can pick it up. I don't think anybody's done any research on that, even though I do know people raise dogs that can smell grass burrs, and the dog will point and point out the grass burr plant, the people flag it, and then come back later. And just a, a lot of things could happen, but I don't think the cattle have been looked at. Is burning a defective prickly pear pads another option? Yeah, I think it would be if you had a uh, a torch that would incinerate the pad to the part where the egg masses and the larvae would all be destroyed. And so that would mean you would have to search through the burn prickly pads to make sure you got rid of enough moisture and live tissue for that to be effective. Uh, there's only one case I know of where the egg masses uh, were put in Ziploc bags and put in a freezer for eight months. And when the egg masses were brought out and put in an enclosed insect type container, they did not hatch. Now, that would not be an effective tool on the land, but would be an effective tool uh, to kill the egg masses. I actually prefer the hammer on the cement method for con controlling the eggs. As the question comes in, and Charles makes a comment that they don't have six inches of soil, much less 24. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, then uh, you're going to be straddled with an issue. Uh, if you do, if you can go to the city, which that's what was done in Angleton, we had to make sure that the county uh, people, when they put the bags in the dump, that it got covered two feet deep with soil. So uh, what does the city dump look like? What are they What are they regularly covering the trash with? Uh, I think if you put the prickly pear in a, bar in a barrel and, and poured a flammable fluid on top of it, uh, you may or may not kill the prickly pear because again, the pads that are infected are full of moisture. Uh, until that moisture is boiled out by the heat of the fire, the prickly pear pad itself is not going to catch on fire. And unless the material burns, like in a prescribed burn with dry grass, you may not kill all the larvae inside. So the, these are good questions, uh, and I can understand there may be a disposal problem. Uh, and I've... I've uh, offered you one, the burial, that we know works, but these other ones, we're just going to have to look into them as we get there. And, uh, Good Carrie, questions. Carrie says, uh, thank you for sharing. And what I'm going to do at this time, I'm going to pop out the survey. If it cover, covers up your screen, uh, just simply click on your little green icon on the, on the bottom of the screen, and that should bring you back to, to the Adobe Connect. You should still be able to hear. Uh, next question, and, and uh, let me go ahead and kick this uh, slide over. Next question, what could be the effects of the moth on bobwhite quail since they will use pears as nesting cover in, in some situations? Well, when you when you look at bobwhite quail, uh, 
the earliest records that we have, and then, of course, research information from our various uh, nesting bird scientists would show that quail used bunch grasses at the highest level for nesting and for not being seen by our predator. Uh, one remark I remember hearing from our retired extension wildlife specialist, Dale Rollins, is that the nesting by quail and prickly pear is the last defense and nesting area that the quail have when the bunch grasses, like little blue stem, have been removed, grazed out, uh, disturbed on the land. So. But in, in the concept of nesting for quail, it is the bunch grass that is the uh, kind of plant material that quail are going to use the most. If I, if I get to having to nest inside prickly pear, you're kind of down in, in, in a lesser quality, lower successional type land. And, and in that environment, the quail are just going to be hanging on. And we have another question, kind of a double question. Uh, what guarantee strategies would you propose? And then make comments. As I would say, the practical regulation strategies would would you propose? Uh, if we had a regulatory strategy, and and I will tell you that the Texas Department of Agriculture uh, is starting an effort to inspect nurseries and and wholesale greenhouse type companies that that grow prickly pear that sell prickly pear we're starting to do an inspection in that area where most of our work has been done on the sand dunes and inland on the land yeah, so we, that that kind of inspection but again to do inspections and be plant specific is is going to take more time and more personnel and uh the, the cactus moth is not the only current problem that we have in the state of Texas. As we have another question coming in, let me say that our next session is going to be on May 7th. Uh, range of pasture updates, our Dr. Bob Lyons will be our speaker, and there's one CEU general attached to it. If you're not following us on Facebook, you can follow us on facebook.com slash txrange. You can also visit our web website, texasrangewebinars.tamu.edu. The next question is, would, would it, Encourage management for birds and bats help reduce uh, adult moth numbers in certain areas. Oh, I think uh, things go hand in hand in our ecosystem, and a lot of the things that we do to encourage birds and bats uh, might be very good for prickly pear and not having the cactus moth. The cactus moth does fly at nighttime. It is a nocturnal moth, and so the mating and everything is done at nighttime. We don't really find them or catch them during the daytime. So do do we have bats that eat moths? Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I see more questions coming in. Uh, it, well, they're asking is if y'all having trouble at, uh, accessing the survey, just click on the link that I provided, and it'll take you to the survey. Dr. Rector, thank you for today. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, lots of good information. I appreciate you, Pete, and and helping get our webinar established and set up. It's it's always a wonderful time uh, to co-host the webinar with you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you.